Good morning. The lights are coming on. Are you still awake? All right, good. There's still a chance for you to fall asleep during my message. And that's, that's what we're counting on. Hey, no, uh, before I begin, I want to just say something about one or two of the announcement slides that you may have seen scrolling across pre-service. One slide said Momentum Mondays starts September 12th. So uh, that's the first time that's been up there and maybe the first time you've heard of such a thing. We have been just truly encouraged and blessed by the number of guests that continue to come and worship with us and some of you are guests this morning. So on, on Momentum Mondays, we want to take an hour on Monday evenings to go by and just bless those that have been visiting us with a little gift, uh, a word of encouragement, uh, maybe even to write some letters to some folks that maybe have been homebound or that are in need of a ministry touch or care. This is an opportunity for you guys as the body of Christ to engage in a meaningful way to follow up with those that have been here or those we've been missing. So Momentum Monday is coming in just a few weeks. And then you may have also noticed that beginning on September 7th, We've, we've got some new classes starting on Wednesday nights. So ladies are going to be going through the book of Ruth, and it looks like a compelling study. And then the men are going to be going through the book of Galatians. And um, if you just kind of pay attention to those slides over the coming weeks, it'll show you the room numbers. And we start on Wednesday nights at 630. So now the announcements are out of the way. If you have your Bibles... And I hope that you do. Uh, open them with me to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 26. And, and by the way, this morning, if, if you are a guest with us, and, or maybe you're just not a guest, maybe you've been here for some time, and you don't have a Bible of your own, those black Bibles in the pew in front of you are intended for you to use. So we would love for you to just take one of those home and begin to read it, to begin to encourage, be encouraged by the truth of God's word. So uh, it's perfectly fine to just take that with you as you go this morning. Are we at Acts chapter 26? All right. Well, being there, let's look at verse four. This is what the word of God says. <clears throat> my manner of life from my youth spent from the beginning among my own nation and in Jerusalem, is known by all the Jews. They have known for a long time, if they're willing to testify, that according to the strictest party of our religion, I have lived as a Pharisee. And now I stand here on trial because of my hope and the promise made by God to our fathers, to which our 12 tribes hope to attain, as they earnestly worship night and day. And for this hope, I am accused by Jews, O king. Why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did so in Jerusalem. I, I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priest, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. In this connection, I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. Now, I probably should have given you a little bit more context before I began to read. So that was the words of the apostle Paul. And the very first time we see Paul appear in scripture, the first time we encounter him, he, he's known as Saul of Tarsus. And he's a young man that's holding the tunics, holding the, the garments of Jewish leaders as they stone Stephen to death. And it's really a case of, man, an evil and wicked man who is 
transformed by the grace and the power of God. But this is a testimony that is given before a king of what his life was like. And, and Johnny earlier read from Philippians chapter 3, another testimony of Paul's life. So um, as, we, as we think about Paul's life, um, some images that you may not associate with Paul's life come to mind. So here's the first one. Now, this is the interactive part of the message. You're a mean one. All right, you guys good. You know who that is. That's Mr. Grinch. Right, so there's the Grinch. And do you know who this guy is? Go ahead and somebody say it. Gru. Yes, Gru. Uh, and then this guy, he needed some signage behind him so you'd know who he is. But it is. Scrooge, that's right. So hard to see, I know, in the lighting up here. But so the Grinch, Gru, and Scrooge remind me of the Apostle Paul. Does, has anybody made the connection yet? So, so if you look at the Grinch, man, he is the worst. He goes into Whoville and he steals all the Who kids' toys on Christmas. He is the worst. But suddenly his heart grows by 10 times and he is the, the hero of the story by the end and everybody loves the Grinch. And what about Gru, Despicable Me? He is the evil villain who, with the help of all his minions, is plotting to capture the moon. But these little girls come into his life and suddenly Gru is the hero that we all love. And Scrooge, the ultimate uh, evil uh, hero, or the evil man who becomes the hero as he's visited by the ghost of Christmas past, Christmas present, and Christmas future. And he has such a remarkable heart change. But uh, so as you see, these pictures are all people who were villains who became heroes. But the greatest of all of them is the next picture, which is Darth Vader. I mean, the absolute ultimate best villain. He enters into the screen and everybody is just fearful. Darth Vader with his breathing. I'm not going to do it. I'm tempted to, but I'm not going to do it. But uh, as a kid, I was just captivated by Star Wars. And, and there's another generation that's come to know who Darth Vader in Star Wars is, but he is the ultimate villain. And, and we didn't have uh, social media and we didn't have all that, that is accessible to search things out. But I remember when The Empire Strikes Back came out in theaters, everybody said, is it true? Do you really think Darth Vader is Luke's father? Could it be? And, and so there's this horrible villain, Darth Vader, and by the return of the Jedi, Luke is able to see Anakin turned and he destroys the emperor and restores balance to the force. You guys are not nearly as impressed as I am with the turning of Darth Vader, but uh, what, what pales all of those stories by comparison is the life of Paul. Uh, Paul who, in, in all that he thought he was doing in serving God, was, was absolutely destroying in his own life the kingdom of God. And the story of Paul and what we're looking at this morning, you need to know this. God can use anyone. And we've been looking at that. We looked at David, somebody who maybe didn't look like he would be serving. We looked at Rahab, whose past didn't look like there. And then we're looking at Paul, who is so far from God and so opposed to the things of Jesus. God can use anyone, even this morning, you. Now, if, if you look back at Paul's testimony, if you look back at his life, he begins this conversation with the king, Herod Agrippa, and he says, everyone knows the kind of life I lived. If they'd be willing to testify about it, everyone would say, I was the most religious, the most strict Jew there could be. I was living as a Pharisee, I was doing all the things, checking all the boxes of what was required to be a good and godly person. As a matter of fact, if you lived in Paul's day 
and you weren't a believer in Christ, but you lived in Israel, you would look to Paul and you would say, man, there goes a rock star. He is going to be the next big thing. This guy has got it together. He's doing everything right. But he was merely a religious person. And and you know what? To this day, there are people who still tend to check all the right boxes. That was my story growing up. I went to church. My parents took me all the time. I knew all the right things to say about Jesus. I had a Bible. I read it. I marked it. I memorized scripture. I did all these things that a Christian could do. But I was a very religious person. But here's the truth that we need to realize. Hell is filled with religious people. Being a religious person doesn't make you right with God. Being a spiritual person and being spiritually minded does not put you in a right relationship with God. And and if we're looking at our own lives and we're resting on how good and moral and upright and spiritually minded we are, friends, you and I run the danger of busting the gates of hell wide open. This is what Jesus said to his disciples. Many will come to me on that day in Matthew chapter 7 and cry out, Lord, Lord, did we not do many things in your name? Casting out demons, healing the sick, many miracles. And Jesus looks at them and says, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness, for I do not know you. To, to, to think that somehow God is going to use us because we've got our act together and we are doing all the right things and we've checked the right boxes and we're living for God. It, it might be a good idea to just step back in that moment and, and ask, are you doing all those right things from a changed heart? a transformed life, or in some way hoping that doing all those things will get the attention and the favor of God. See, the Bible says it this way. All of our righteous acts, it says in Isaiah, all of our righteousness is nothing but a filthy rag before God. The best we could do, the best we could offer, the best we could muster, all the goodness that we have, God looks at it and says, that that belongs in the garbage. God is so holy and so beyond us. Every single one of us in this room was born a sinner, both by nature and by choice. We, We try to do the right things, but if we're to be really honest, we don't need people to tell us that we've messed up in life because we're keenly aware of our own failures and struggles. But we would sometimes wanna hide those and push them off to the side just to think, well, my good things are gonna outweigh my bad. And perhaps in some way, the apostle Paul and all those who watched his life said, man, I know he's not perfect, but he's the closest thing we got. He's really there. As a matter of fact, I think there's something about performance-based religion that leaves you hungering and longing for the approval of others. That's what Paul was doing. He had made a name for himself. He's a Pharisee, and he even talked about it when he's writing to the church at Philippi. I was the Pharisee of Pharisees. Like, there was no one better than me. I, I got this. I'm doing it, but... Even as he appeals to all those that see and know and watch his life, I want you to understand that living for the approval of others will blind you to spiritual realities. Friends, if you are looking for others to validate who you are and what you are doing, you will miss the spiritual reality that you need Christ. You need Jesus And friends, this goes for those who would say, I belong to Christ. That somehow if you come to Jesus, repenting of your sin and trusting in what he alone can do for you, if somehow you try to live the Christian life in your own strength from that point forward. And you want people to 
just think of you as a godly man or a godly woman or a person of prayer or such incredible giftedness, whatever it is that you're looking from others, can I tell you that your fulfillment, your hope, and your satisfaction is to be found in Jesus and in him alone? I I don't know what more commendation you need, how much more uh, approval you would need in this life than to hear this. God sent his one and only son into this world to die a sinner's death for you. If you, if you think about the, the enormity of that, that, that the God of all creation stepped out of heaven into earth and died a sinner's death that you deserve so that you might have life in him, there's no greater approval you will ever seek or find. But as Paul is seeking the justification of men, he's seeking the approval of men, he goes on to tell about all those things that he did. He said, I I thought that I needed to oppose Jesus of Nazareth in in many ways. And he goes on to this list of all the ways that he began to oppose Jesus. He, He talked about persecuting believers. He talked about trying to get them to blaspheme, meaning to say something uh, untrue or uh, denigrating towards God. He he sought to arrest them. He gave a vote to have them killed. All of these things that he could do, he pursued over and over and over again. And, And your life may not look like somebody who is a murderer or somebody who has given consent to kill others. I mean, that's the Apostle Paul's testimony, but I imagine if you were to think about your own life, you think about ways that you have turned your back towards God or the things of God, pursued your own desires. And here's the reality. You can justify every bad decision you make. You don't even have to really try. You're just kind of hardwired this way. Well, it's, it's not that bad. It's not that big of a deal. I'm not as bad as this person. And we just excuse, 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 or I can still do this, or I can still, we just pile on excuses to justify every bad decision that we've made. And the apostle Paul was doing that in religious terms. And maybe you and I don't do that with our religion, but maybe we do it other ways. Well, I mean, it's just, it's just a white lie. I mean, I, I don't want to really, I don't, I, don't, I don't like conflict. And I mean, why would I tell the truth when it could be hurtful? Or you know, it's, it's just this little video on my phone. It's just me and my phone. It's not hurting anyone else. Or it's just manipulating the figures just a little bit to make them look better. I, I, I don't know what we do, but boy, we we find a way to justify every bad decision that we make. But here's the truth. You are not the judge, jury, and executioner of justice in your life. And not, not in the here and now, nor in eternity. There's one who is just, who sits upon his throne, who looks over you in his holiness, and says, no sin shall enter my presence. And and if you were to stay on this path for very long, as you think about justifying your own behaviors or think about some of the things you've done in your life, perhaps you'd come to this point. I I just don't know that God could ever do anything with my life. I've I've just, I've, I've gone too far, I've messed up. There, there's, there's, there's nothing I can do. And, and the reality is, there's nothing you can do. Uh, you, you can't kind of pull yourself up by your bootstraps and start over and do better and try harder. It, it doesn't work like that. But you are never beyond the reach of God. It doesn't matter where you are, God in 
all of his power, all of his grace, all of his glory can reach to you. And maybe he's reaching out to you even this day to say, look at me, look to me, trust me, follow me. I want you. And, and friend, God's arm isn't too short to save you. And he's not so weak that he can't lift you up out of wherever you are and make you a child of God. Yes, you. And and so the, the thing is, God doesn't just let us stay where we are. Paul's testimony ended where I, I stopped in verse 12. He said, and in that capacity, I was headed to Damascus. And I'm, I'm going to persecute the followers of Jesus all the way there. And I've got papers. They're going to be arrested. Some of them are going to die because they're the leaders. And he's going in that capacity to just live for God as he's justified in his own mind. But on that road, he encountered a blinding light and a heavenly voice. And his life forever was changed. You see, in, in that moment, he, he understood that he had been fighting against the very one who was his savior and redeemer. God encountered Paul on that road and he was physically blind, but spiritually he had never seen more clearly. And he cried out for the salvation that comes from Jesus and from Jesus alone. And do you know how the gospel works? This is how the gospel works. When Paul finished his course, when he ran his race, when his cup was poured out, Paul entered heaven to the cheers of those he had persecuted and even killed. That's how the gospel works. You see this life that was no good and was headed nowhere, God redeemed and changed in a moment. And that could be your story today. That may be exactly where God is finding you in this very moment. And he's crying out to you, would you look to me? Would you trust me? And there comes a point when we're so convicted by the weight of our own foolish choices, our own sin, and we're tired of the life that we've been living and the misery that we find ourselves like the story of the prodigal son. We find ourselves just living among the pigs and saying, I've had enough of this. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm just going to go back to my father. And maybe God is calling you in this moment, come to me. Trust me. And you need to know that the power to change your life is found only in the resurrection of Jesus. This isn't, uh, well, I'm just gonna try this on for a minute. I'm gonna try to do better from this point forward. No, this is, this is coming to Jesus with all that you are and asking him to give you all that he has. God, the same way that you raised Jesus from the dead, would you raise me and give me new life and help me to live for you? That's the exchange of the sinful life for the redeemed life. And and when God changes your life, when he saves you, when he calls you his own, it's a lot like what happened to the apostle Paul on that road to Damascus. He looked at Paul and he said, now I've I've got a task for you. Here's your job, Paul. You're going to be a light to the Gentiles. You're going to explain the good news and the power of Jesus to change and transform lives. And you're going to spend all of your life telling others about Jesus. Now, it may not be what you do with your career and your vocation. It may not change what you do for a living, but it will change who you are because when you are in Christ, when God has saved you, your life is a living demonstration of the power of God. People are watching your life. People are observing and seeing you, but what they're seeing in you is the power of God in you that's changing and transforming your desires, your habits, who, who you 
hang out with, the things that you pursue. It's not that you are suddenly just becoming a more religious person. There's a change in your heart from the inside out that transforms who you are. And, and dear Christian, I wonder today, is your life reflecting the demonstration of God's power? Are, are you living in such a way that it's not pointing to you and all the good things you've done, but it's pointing to God at work in you and through you? Do you take the time to point others to Jesus? Tell them of all that he's done. We can sing it and it's powerful. All my life you've been so faithful. All my life you've been so, so good. But who will you tell this week about what he's done that's been so good? The ways that he's been faithful. What stories will you recount of the change that he's brought in your life so that people would see and know and appreciate the power of God available even to them? You see, God will use anyone to fulfill his purposes. And, and friend, you, you may think in this moment, I, I'm so far from God. There, there's no way he could, he could do anything with my life. Uh, I, I've seen enough to know that that's the exact kind of life that God will use in powerful ways to absolutely show off who he is and what he does. So maybe there's someone this morning and in your heart, you know that your response to God and your response to his word this morning needs to be something like this. God, forgive me a sinner. God, have mercy on me. Give me new life. Help me to live for you. Christian, it may be this morning, God, I, I just want to come back to you and I want your power to be seen in my life. I want people to know what you've done for me. It, it may be, I, I need a community of faith to encourage me, to stand beside me and to push me towards being like Christ. I don't know exactly where the Lord is leading you to respond, but I know he's calling you to respond this day. They wouldn't just merely be hearers of the word, come sit down, I've done the church thing, but we would truly be changed by the truth of God's word. So in just a moment, I'm gonna to begin to pray. And I'm praying for you. I mean, friend, if I could just sit across a table from you I would want to have this conversation with you, say, has there been a time in your life where you have truly known that you are a sinner in need of God's grace? Have you turned from your sin to trust Jesus? And maybe today is that day for you. Or I would just sit across from you and say, is your life truly pointing to Christ and the way he changes you. There's something you need to let go of today. Is, is there a turning to Jesus that needs to happen in your life, Christian? Would you pray with me? So with your heads bowed and, and your eyes closed, not because that's how God hears us, but just so that there's not a distraction about you. Friend, if, if you need to trust Christ in this moment, there's not a magic prayer you can pray that makes you a Christian. There's, there's no, nothing like that. But if you would pray from your heart to God's something like this, I know he will hear you and I know he'll give you new life. So if you're ready to trust Christ in this moment, you'd maybe say something like this, dear God, I know I'm a sinner God, I know that I've lived life in my own terms and I haven't really been living for you, not in the least. God, I know what I deserve is separation, but I truly believe that Jesus died a sinner's death even for me. 
the punishment that I deserve was laid upon him. So God, forgive me of my sin. And God, just as you raised Jesus from the dead, would you raise me right now to new life? Give me your power that I would live for you. God, thank you for saving me. Thank you for life that is life in Christ. And Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters, many who have named the name of Jesus and are living for him. I, I pray that even in this moment, you would just stir in their hearts a deeper desire to not only to know you, but to make you known. God, that you would you'd help us to be that living picture for all to see the power of God at work in our lives. And Father, how we thank you for the church for men and women who gather together to do life together, to pursue and to follow you. And God, I, I pray that if you're drawing people to be a part of this fellowship and to serve you, that with joy they would, they would respond to your gracious work in their lives. Lord, we love you. And we give this time to you to respond to your word and your truth. In Jesus' name I pray.